Hey everybody, welcome back to the quest for the bestest from Backlog Banter. That's right, Quest is back. The Oscars were last night and we all watched them, or at least we looked at the results, um, as in Abram's case. And we are so ready to talk about the winner, if you didn't know, was Nomadland to whose surprise exactly? I don't think anyone's. But uh, not ours. No ones. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there were there were some surprising some surprising things during the Oscars, but we'll talk about that on BLBS this Sunday. So make sure to tune in for that. Uh, TMO, I don't mean to tear the rug rug out from under you, but also while you're down there, in the description that is, join <laughs> join our Discord. And uh, there's some letterbox lists down there. There's a subscribe button and there's a like button. For this Absolutely, video. yeah. So. We are here to talk about Nomadland. We're going to figure out, we got two missions today. We got to figure out where Nomadland ranks on our big list because it is a best picture winner. And yes. the goal of the quest for the bestest is to figure out where they all line up. And we get to spin that oh so sweet number wheel and we get to find out some new movie. I've never, I, I mean, we used to get so hyped about this every week and it kind of lost, yeah. it's, it's kind of lost its magic. And then we took a good month and a half break from spinning. Mm -hmm. And oh my God. I want to spin that freaking wheel, man. I want to spin that wheel so bad. I'm I'm loving it. But that's at the end after we place it. So what did you guys think? What do you guys think of Nomadland as a Best Picture winner? Um, and I don't know. Lead me through your process of beginning to think about where it goes on this pretty big list now. So for me, if I, if I can steal the ball first, now that the, the air of, of objectivism is gone from our Oscars predictions list, I am personally disappointed because I don't think that Nomadland was the strongest film uh, right. of the nominees. And if the listeners here are not familiar with our, our YouTube channel as much, you know, and they didn't watch those videos. And those were, were audio also, so I'm completely making it a non separate yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. But the point <laughs> is, we like other films more. Particularly, I loved Sound of Metal. And I wanted to see that when Likewise. that said, mm -hmm. I think that Nomadland is a very strong and original film. And as we've been watching a lot of best pictures, we've been finding a lot of things that aren't that remarkable. So actually, Nomadland for me is going to be going fairly high on our list of, of mm -hmm. overall best pictures, even if I don't think it was the strongest 2020 candidate by far. I, yeah. I think for me going into this, this was one of the best picture nominees from this year that I didn't personally find a lot to grab onto within myself but i reckon i recognize a lot of its merits we discussed everything in our review of it we talked about how well it handles most everything that it does and i'm very happy that it won best picture even if it wasn't my personal pick because i'm always looking for the best best picture winners that are something different that stand out from the crowd that have a different tone that have a unique concept and no man land is definitely nothing like anything else we've seen and i'm so i'm, I'm happy from that regard that it won but when comparing it to other films that uh, that we have seen that I think are have clearly st stood the test of time, that are really strong in terms of what they do with unique characters and everything. Of course, Nomadland has elements of that, but it's going to, even though it's a great movie, when it's up against these, I don't know exactly where I would put it uh, up near the top. Yeah, uh, I, I think Tucker raised an interesting point of that. It's 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 very tough to rank these among movies from like the '50s and the '80s. Uh, we we've had more time to sit on those uh, as a as a culture, as cultured fellas. But Nomadland <laughs> is brand spanking new, so it's hard to really it's it, it's difficult, but we, it can be done because we're bright as well. It can be done to rank them against each other. And um, what I think is going to stand the test of time for Nomadland, at least, is the uh. The way that it the way that it blurs the lines of fiction and nonfiction. We talked about that in our quest for the bestest review uh, for the twenty twenty one nominees, and uh, I think uh, I don't think any any performances, which is a lot of things that we glom onto, and in, in a lot of our quest reviews, I don't think any of the performances are going to be uh, stand the test of time. But maybe the cinematography, as well as a strong you know, the the va the vast empty uh, vistas that Chloe Zhao and um, I forget the cinematographer's name. We just we just heard it last night during the Oscars because it did win best cinematography as well. Deserved, I might. Add. Wait, no, no, it did Mank won? Mank won, yeah, and that won. was a big upset. I was I was putting my head cannon in there for the Oscars. It should have won best cinematography because, like I said, beautiful cinematography in this, beautiful use of the of the natural light, and uh, those are the aspects of the film I think are going to stand the test of time. And uh, those are what I'm those are what uh, I'm measuring against the other best picture winners I'm with. I agree a lot with Abram. I did have Nomadland as my number one pick, 
in terms of like my personal, like I think it's going to win and I think it should win. Um, and so I'm very happy that it won. And I do think that it's the inventiveness of it really puts it up there in terms of, you know, it's a top half film in my book completely. Um, and I'm kind of loose. I have a loose idea of, of which exact number I want it to go. But like you said, Tanner, I think this this blurred lines of fiction and nonfiction is really interesting. It's not something that we really see in films alone and not, I mean, really don't see in Best Picture winners. Um, it's directed by an Asian American woman. This is something that we really don't see in, um, you know, in Best Picture winners at all. They're all white men. And yeah. um, <laughs> except and for I, one. Yep. Except for, except for, well, old Hurt Locker, Catherine Bigelow added another female director to the Best Directors list last night, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but that the the direction of this film, Chloe Zhao won for that, is I think is really excellent. And I think that this the the writing and the pacing and there's a lot of stuff in it that I, I really glom onto and I really like. Um and I think that Abram's right, the inventiveness of it, it's it's got this this new flair that um doesn't always show up in best picture winners from, you know, we've there are some very, very best picturey <laughs> films. And while this is yeah. a, sort of a best picturey film, it's different. And it's different enough in my book to uh, to get it up there. Yeah, yeah. I think that we really can't sell short, especially as I'm looking right now at our list of of films. So many of these fall into archetypes, very clear genre, very clear theme, all of these things. Of course, we've seen only a fraction of of the history's best picture winners, but I think it, you know, irrespective of the fact that the film just came out, already it poses such a a unique you know, contribution to the canon of Best Picture winners, which I think is deserving of really high recognition. Is it characters we really care about? I don't know. But I mean, you can look at a lot of the films we have ranked pretty high and and say that they're up there on the merit of one or two aspects, not the the whole. You know, I don't think there are many films on our list that we have as high as they are because every single fundamental element that they have is across the board stellar and compelling and and i think that's I think a, that, that's our top four only is our is our really mm -hmm. just like across the board excellent films yeah yeah so i think that that puts us in a position where nomad land in my opinion should be very high even though sound of metal should have been a lot higher than it <laughs> very true <laughs> darius rucker should have got that <laughs> award and <laughs> A little inside quest joke for everyone. <laughs> Way back when. Um. So, do are you guys thinking that you're you're you have your numbers? You wanna you wanna send them to me, and we can just figure this out and chat about where our our <laughs> aggregate is, or um, we need to have some convincing as to uh, as to what specific number it is. Because I think I've got a number set in my brain, mm. um, where do, I want it to go. Well, I'm about to I'm go, about to send my number to you through the interwebs through the power of the World Wide Web. You're about to send your number, okay? Yeah, I feel like this is this is a, a circumstance where we're going to have much more discussion after sending the number and seeing where it is, opposed to yeah. beforehand. Yeah. Of course, yeah. because keep in mind, in in our mini series, we reviewed all of the nominees, including Nomadland. So if you want our full thoughts on that film, you're better off checking out our actual review opposed yeah. to just this. Which is why we're not covering, you know, everything about the film. Specifically, this is mostly in comparison. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Timo, have you received the results? I do Mr. have Hans. the results. And I, I was trying to figure out how to phrase this like a, like they do at the Oscars with, with the envelope. But I've got my phone here where the results are. The number is nine and a quarter. Oh, okay. okay. Not nine and three quarters, nine and one quarter. Nine and nine point two five. So mm -hmm. that would put it at number 10 because it goes below number nine mm -hmm. um, in between Kramer versus Kramer and Chicago. I would say I'm very happy with that because that is the number that I chose. That is Tucker. <laughs> Tucker did send us a 10. Abram sent mm -hmm. us an 11. I sent a seven. And I don't remember what Tanner, Tanner, what did you send us? Nine. Nine. So we were very close. I mean, seven to 11 is a pretty low range out of 26 is our entire list right now. Now 27. Now 27. Yeah. So what do you what do you guys think about that? So hmm. here's the thing. I actually, I've got to put it out there is that I initially wanted this in the 14, 15 range, but I am sort of removing the guff that I had with the film in comparison to its its competitors for best picture and looking at okay this what it, it's very important it's very different it's it, it's 
probably going to stand the test of time. And this is going to be one of the more interesting best picture winners in terms of being different that we're going to watch. And, and I think it deserves some credit for that. So I, I slid mine up from 14 to 10, um, which, you know, we'll, I don't know how much that would have really impacted maybe a, a spot down if anything. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's a pretty good sign that we're all relatively, uh, you know, on the same yeah. page with this one. I, I think we, I think we really nailed it with saying like, there are some, there are some, blatant standout elements of nomad land that really set it above in that upper crust but across the board it, it really doesn't break into that top four or top five sort of ranking mm-hmm. yeah i was really thinking about it in terms of our real early films that we talked about which is like argo and the hurt locker um the, these films are, are, are a real interesting i don't they're not a thorn in my side uh, to say so but they do mm, pose some yeah. challenges for me when i'm ranking and i personally put it one above the Hurt Locker, um, just because I think that Nomadland does a lot with its story. It has a lot to say, and I think that actually Hurt Locker is a pretty inventive in its cinematography and and the story that it tells. But Nomadland was a lot more affecting to me. It I, its messages yeah. and its and its real ability to give you this message with a real subtle. You know, it never says it's what it's about. The move the film never goes into and dives in and says. I'm talking about, you know, the state of being an American or being being an, an, an itinerant American in, you know, 2012 or whenever it takes place. Um, yeah. But you get that. You understand that as you watch it. And to me, that's that is a very impressive and difficult thing to accomplish. So it ended up there. You know, I was not a big fan of Spotlight when we watched it way back in the day. Um, and so I think Nomadland is a better film than Spotlight. But you know, right around there, Kramer versus Kramer Chicago. These are all good films. It's all good company. And I'm not like, I'm horribly upset about where it goes. You know, I'll yeah. advocate for a, a spot higher, but if everyone says no, then we'll be fine with that. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I only put it above Kramer versus Kramer because I think while Kramer versus Kramer is very interesting and in what it does as a, as a very, you know, toned down character drama, uh, I, I think Nomadland sort of breaks into that upper crust with its with its uh, uh, subtleness, what, subtleism. Right? Subtleism. subtleism. I always forget. I always forget, and it's the greatest joke that we have on this show because it kills every time. <laughs> I would like to raise two things. First is a non sequitur, but you can't stop me. I finally okay. watched to its completion Apocalypse Now the other mm-hmm. the other week for class, and the fact that that lost to Kramer v Kramer is an absolute travesty. So on uh, those yeah. grounds, I would like to put. No Madland above, but in my conscience, I think that it's a, in a good position right now, largely because for me personally, I think there are some elements of uh, No Madland that I can't really reconcile with its overall message. I think some of the fictional elements take away from the the non-fictional components, which I feel are stronger. And mm-hmm. and I think the way that the film sits on the intersection of, of of documentary and narrative storytelling is is compelling, but it doesn't always mesh for me. And I think when we're looking at these films that are pretty high up they have such cohesive and compelling visions that i feel like are executed on in their entire entirety and i think that the story of nomad land is a little bit personally it's a little bit more conflicted and i don't know if that vision is always on the no, uh, on the nose and the dot as i said combined mm-hmm. where i wanted it to be so because of that i think that the sum of its parts puts it in in the in the top sector of our list but i don't think it it cracks you know the the five six seven range for me personally because i think that there is a a actually stronger nomad land that could have been made with a few different artistic decisions sure yeah honestly learning about this film a little more last night i i knew a good amount about it for through the zeitgeist that had been popular and, and facts had been circulating around but last night i was informed by by tanner that this is based on a book which i knew but that the book is based on the real people and that this is based on them and their fictionalized elements of, of those real people's lives in the book, which were adapted to the screen. And and I think the the medley of uh, fiction and nonfiction, which I think is one of this film's most more interesting aspects, I think you're right in that it doesn't necessarily land all the time. Um, one of the more emotionally impactful moments of the film and, and what they chose to show for the clip uh, before it was winning or before... Uh, the best picture nominee was announced is when Swanky is talking about, you know, when I die, I hope my friends gather around the fire and talk, toss a rock and, you know, remember me. And, and in my mind, okay, this is really interesting because this is based on a real person. And honestly, through watching the movie and up until last night, 
I thought she had actually died, which is why I thought that scene where they did gather on the fire and toss a rock into it was so impactful. But she was on the stage last night with a one best picture. So uh, unless there's some some schmuckery going on, she's not deceased. Uh, but I do think that's really interesting to see how they changed the story of these people's lives while basing it on their actual lives. But it's a little bit confusing to me. I can't really tell what's what's supposed to be real and what's not. Um, so that definitely that definitely changed how I thought about this film a little bit. Mm. And also just looking back on Nomadland, having seen it twice, I just don't know how memorable this film is going to be to me. I think yeah. when I think about it, I'll think of, I'll think of Francis McDormand. I'll think of the medley of fiction and nonfiction. I'll think about the cinematography, but when it comes to the films that are above it and some of the ones that are even below it, it's performances, it's cinematography, it's score. It's, it's a lot of really memorable aspects that I personally enjoyed a lot when watching them. And no, my land just doesn't have that that combination of memorable aspects for me. Hmm. It's very interesting that the that you take the not knowing what's fiction and nonfiction is confusing. And for me, I always accept whatever a movie tells me. So if a movie tells me something, I believe it. I I do not question. Sheep Mo is here. And yeah, um, and so here. for me, while watching No Man Land, I, like, oh yeah, she died. Okay, well there we go. She's dead. And um and that doesn't you know it's a movie, so it doesn't matter a huge amount to me that. Oh, in fact, she's actually alive because it makes for, I think, a more interesting and better story. That said, I see your point. Um, and I still think that that blurring is is really what makes the film so interesting and is what, you know, we're going to keep bringing it up over and over again here. But that, yeah, it's what sets it apart, really. I think one final note, at least for me personally, is I would side with Timo and to get away from, you know, the fiction, the nonfiction, the blurring are, are buzzwords for right now. Yeah. And to go to my personal buzzwords, I think that Nomadland, in the face of my criticism of it, has a lot of theme and a lot of feel. I think that it's a very evocative film. I, I know Tucker likes to criticize me for, for really hammering these concepts home, but I think that it's inventive in its theme, in its depiction of subject matter and what you take away from it. So I do think this is going to be an enduring film. I think that the messages here and the lifestyles and the ideologies and the philosophies are transient, just as the people in the film are. And, and I think they will stick with audiences as time moves forward. And I do think that even though the film doesn't always hit the way I want it to, it's it's really impactful in sort of subversive ways that make it really memorable. So I think that it should not be anywhere lower on this list, but I yeah. just don't think it should go any higher either. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, spinning off of Abram's point, I think that Nomadland captures a very interesting point in uh, American history, which is strange to say because it's set eight years ago yeah. and it's <laughs> production and things like that. Uh, but I think, th I think there is something to be said about, you know, how it, how it, how it captures these people's psyches and their lives. And while it, while it uh, embellishes some things to make a to make a uh, fictional narrative, um, I think that the the, the non-fictional aspects of it are still there. The performances from the real people feel real, if you can believe it. And uh, one thing that will always stick me, with me from this movie is the conversation that Fern has with Bob. Oh, yeah, about, I was going to bring uh, that one up. Uh, that that in my opinion, that's what they should have put up. Uh, that's the clip that they should have used for the the best picture montage. That's also like but, the uh, climax it, scene and a bit of a spoiler in the movie. But well, yeah. fair enough, I guess so. <laughs> but but uh, I think that scene altogether really sums up what is going to stick with me from Nomadland. Yeah. So am I, am I hearing a number nine? Because Abram um, is has his apocalypse now. Kramer v Kramer qualms. <laughs> Um, and I would be okay with moving it up. And Tanner, I put it there. Tanner so put, it put it at number nine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let's go with okay. it. So number we nine will is. we will slot it at number nine in between Spotlight and Kramer versus Kramer. That sounds sounds like a pretty good spot to me. I mean, out of twenty seven, number nine, that's like way up there, top third. So mm -hmm. you know, good job, good job, Chloe Zhao. I mean, that's really that's all I have to say about the film. To be honest, it's great. I think everyone should watch it. Um, you know, if you didn't it see it already, history. 
it made history by being the first best picture and winner where one of your producers got up on stage and howled like a wolf. Yes. Oh, there are, there are, there are two wolves inside you. And one of them is Francis McDormand. <laughs> <laughs> and then Francis McDormand won best actor a little while later and gave a very mild mannered and short speech. <laughs> and he's like, all right, I got three of these. I got two other these at home. We'll be all right. We'll be all well, right. She, got, she has four Oscars now. She's a two four time per- Oscar winner. Three performances and one for a producer as Nomad for Nomadland. And I'm just going to say, I th- think Frances McDormand is great in this movie. Yeah. I think that yeah. she, she, does, she does a lot of heavy lifting in getting those performances from our non-actors, which that, I mean, we, we didn't talk about that, but holy crap. How, how, did, how did Chloe Zhao get those great performances out of all those? Best director, well-earned. Well-earned best director. Extremely yeah. well-earned. If there's one thing you can say about Oscars 2021, it's that everybody who deserved a, an acting uh, award got one, and there were well, no we issues. Will we will get there on Sunday, dear <laughs> Abram, my boy. We'll get there on Sunday. <laughs> so, that's about it. Should we spin that wheel? I would absolutely love to. It would be my absolute oh. pleasure to have you do that. Now, Tucker, I gave you a brief reprieve from uh, from our old sing-songy time, so yeah. I think it's only fitting that as okay. regular quest comes back, the tradition comes back as well. So I'll allow it. Timo, may I? Are you ready? Three. I am ready. Two, <clears> one. <throat> wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital or is it on real? Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? <laughs> and can you read that number just as well as I can? I hope so. It is a 52. It is a That's an old one, right? 52. It's an older one, yeah. Older. I would say... Uh, uh, if if I w- if I may, I would say 1946. That's just my guess, and of course I know uh, because I'm looking at our list. This is 1946. Of- Myrna Loy, Frederick March, Dana Andrews, uh, the best years of our lives, directed by William Wyler. Hmm. Okay. The best I've, years. I, I don't of know our anything lives. about this one. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna caution the audience here. The audience being you three. Uh, this oh. is a 171 minute long film, oh. so you're you're in for a journey. But it is also one that appears to be very highly regarded, and we have people in here who are fans of drinking in, as has been said, a longer film. So hopefully this uh, hits in that way. Well, a three hour movie from the from the 40s. Quest is back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I could not have put it better myself, Tanner. We got a spin wheel. We got a placement for Nomadland. Nomadland's going at number nine out of 27. Next time, we'll be back talking about the best years of our lives, directed by William Wyler, old WW. Um, (laughs) Double W? Double Dub, what's up? (laughs) And um, what can I say? But Quest is back. It's almost the season two, but not really, because not not a whole lot has changed. (laughs) We We will see you next time. Thanks for sticking around. Peace. 